Hello. Welcome to this webinar offered through Dairy XNet, which is a national e-extension resource. This webinar is co-sponsored with the National Association of County Agricultural Agents. My name is Kathy Lee. I'm an Extension Dairy Educator with Michigan State University, and I'll be today's, web, uh, today's uh, moderator of this webinar. The title of today's webinar is Economic Benchmarks for Dairies, Eight Rules You Cannot Break. It will be presented by Gary Saporsky from VitaPlus. Gary Saporsky grew up in Wisconsin and graduated from the University of Wisconsin at River Falls with a degree in animal science. Gary was in the feed industry for 18 years working with feed dealers and consultants. He also spent 17 years with the Citizens Bank in Loyal, Wisconsin as an ag loan officer and later uh, as president and CEO. Gary has been actively involved in various leadership capacities in the state of Wisconsin. And in January of 2008, he was asked to be on the Advisory Council on Agriculture, Industry, and Labor for the Federal Reserve Bank in Chicago. For the past five years, Gary has worked at VitaPlus Corporation, a nutrition firm based in Madison, Wisconsin, and he is their dairy development manager. Gary, at this time, I turn the program over to you, and we look forward to learning about using economic benchmarks on dairy farms. Okay, thanks, Kathy. It's always a delight to be able to share financial information with those that are interested. And boy, I sure hope everybody's interested in that after spending this last week at the World Dairy Expo in Madison. Uh, many, many conversations of financial benchmarks and other types of factors that are going on that are certainly important to, uh, to dairy producers. So uh, there's a picture of me so you get an idea who's speaking with you. And uh, let's talk about uh, some rules that Eight rules, and I, lenders have many, many more rules and ratios that they look at, but if you have a good grasp on the following eight that I'm going to share with you, in fact, I would highly encourage you, next time you sit down with your lender, particularly when you do a year-end balance sheet and uh, cash flow summary and projections for the following year, uh, take these uh, eight, eight benchmarks and have them fill out for your dairy and share with the lender. And then after you pick your lender off the floor and uh, they wonder where you got this information from, you can show them that you really understand what's going on in your dairy. Uh, just to step back a little bit, you know, in the late 70s and 80s, we had milk support of $13.50 and a cost of production of $6 per hundredweight. And if you think about that, that was 50% of the milk check that dairy producers had was theirs, so they could do anything they wanted with it. And I kid people saying, uh, if you don't believe that, they can think about when the blue harvesters were built in the country and other types of expenditures were done. But today, there's an 80% expense rate out there. And the cost of production running around that 1750, and we'll talk more specifically about that when we get to it. But the green blood that runs through all businesses, and particularly dairy, and that's cash, and just what happens with cash flow. So today, you've got to know your numbers. It's, it's just so critical and important. Uh, in the past and today, you took care of cows, and you have to take care of cows and crops, and people made money. In the past, all you need to do was do those two things, and you made money. Today, you have to understand balance sheets and cash flows in order to make things work. And think about Every decision you make on a dairy, from the time you get up to the time you take and hit that pillow, every decision you make, think about how that affects the cash flow of the dairy. And then that effect on the cash flow is going to circle back to the balance sheet. Whether that decision be short-term or long-term, it all comes back to the balance sheet in the form of equity, either lowering the liabilities or increasing the assets. So with that, Let's take a quick preview of what we're going to talk about, and then I'm going to zero in on all, of, all eight of these items. First item, and I'll review these at the end once again, is liquidity of a two-to-one. Again, I'll explain this more thoroughly. Uh, tw no more than 20% of the milk check can go out in the form of interest and principal. You cannot exceed an 85% expense rate on a dairy. 
net per cow between three and five dollars, three and five thousand dollars per cow. Equity position has got to be maintained better than 30 percent, and the asset turnover rate needs to be done in three years. Every three years, you have to turn the assets that you have in your farm with gross income. You need to have an 8 percent return on assets. And this is something that is very rarely talked about, but extremely important when we talk about profitability. And finally, dairy producers need to know what that cost of production is. So let's begin and let's get specific. First of all, liquidity. This is the upper part of the balance sheet. These are current assets compared to current liabilities. Current assets are any asset that is cash are gonna be turned into cash in the next 12 months. Obviously, the first one is cash itself, then savings, and that might be in the form of a money market. And I realize a lot of producers don't have these kind, have savings accounts, but it certainly should be there. Uh, receivables, this is money that's owed you. Uh, perhaps you sold feed or you've sold some cattle and you've got money coming to you. Uh, feed, obviously, is a huge current asset, and that is an item that needs to be turned into cash in the next 12 months. Pretty hard to take a load of corn silage down to the grocery store and trade it for groceries. Um, obviously, that's a pretty facetious comment, but that's really uh, what we're talking about being turned into cash in the next 12 months. And then steers or hogs, um, particularly steers, I see that on dairy farms from time to time. But anyway, we need to have $2 of these current assets compared to the current liabilities. Now, the liabilities are bills over 30 days. And you notice on the current assets, I didn't put the milk check in that you've got coming. But the other thing I don't have here is you've got bills that are less than 30 days. And usually those two things balance out. And uh, depending on the lender, some lenders put that in. But remember, you do have electric bills and feed, feed bills and fuel bills that maybe are due at the end of the month and haven't been paid. So a lot of times, and those will be counterbalanced with that milk check that you've got coming. Uh, other liabilities may be past due rents or past due real estate taxes. Uh, another factor is principal due in the next 12 months. Uh, the interest is a part of the operating statement. The principal due needs to go on the current asset side or current liability side of the balance sheet, and that's the, all the principal that's due in the next 12 months. So we really need to see $2.00 of cash assets of every dollar of liabilities that you owe. Now I see that being cranked down sometimes to $1.50 to one, but this is really important and lenders are getting to spend more and more time and emphasis on this particular factor that they want to see dairy producers that have plenty of liquidity. Now kiddingly, and I'd like to feel that I'm serious about this, but I tell dairy producers you need to have one month's milk check sitting in the checkbook or the money market after all the bills are paid. And not too many, I don't laugh too hard when I say that because a lot of people say, my goodness, Gary, do you have any idea what I can do with all that cash if I had it? And I understand that. But think about 2009, if we'd had some additional cash in the checkbook, how much easier that would have been. All right, let's uh, just go a little further here and uh, a couple other thoughts on that as other considerations as I call it. And that is, if we look at uh, payables due, if you got payables out there, suppliers are charging 18% interest. So that's certainly that you want to make sure you don't have many of those hanging out there. That might be the veterinarian, the feed, uh, all kinds of suppliers. Uh, that's obviously the first way to take it and uh, uh, make sure that you're not spending additional money. The other thing I'd like to add into that, when you talk to your lender, and some of you hopefully are talking to them now, and that is fixing some interest rates. I know a lot of producers have gone with variable rate interest rates in the last uh, five years, and they've come out really well on that. But if you read the fine print on the interest rates, when they're variable, it says they can change on a monthly basis. And right now we've got some dynamics going on with the Federal Reserve, and that's a whole other topic here that we're seeing interest rates increase. In fact, since April, we've seen um, one and a quarter percent increase in interest rates since then. So if you wait too long and let this uh, market get away from you, you may not be able to lock in interest rates as you can in today's market. 
All right. Let's talk about the first item. No more than 20% of your milk check uh, being spent on interest and principal. 15% is better. In fact, uh, when uh, lenders do housing loans, they don't want to see people that buy a house spend any more than 28% of their take-home pay for interest, principal, taxes, and insurance. Well, here we're talking about a dairy operation of business and not spending more than 15% of that gross income in the dairy for the interest and in principal. Simple example, uh, you've got a 50 cow farm, and I can use a few examples here. You've got a quarter million dollars of income. 15% would be 37.375, or 20% would be 50,000. Uh, another example might be here with a 200 cow dairy. You, you can see that 150 compared to 200,000 with the 20%. You have a 500 cow dairy with a gross income of $2.5 million. 15% is $375,000, interest in principal again, or 20% would be $500,000. But figure that out on your own. Take a look at your monthly payments, what you're paying, and divide that by the uh, gross income that you're taking. And this is real key, and this is a real comfort level for lenders out here, uh, staying at 15% or under. If you hit 20%, maybe we've got some time so that maybe the milk check isn't what it should be. Uh, that's where we like to reserve that 20%, but we can't spend more than 20% of the milk check. All right, we should not have expense rates any more than 85% of the gross income of the dairy. Now, that's a simple calculation. It's simply taking the dollars that you're spending in expenses, dividing it by the gross income. Uh, another uh, way to look at that, and certainly is less is better. A lot of times people will ask me as I'm talking about these types of income, well, you know, where should I be, better or less? Well, obviously in this case, less is better uh, when it comes to expense rate. Now, a simple way to do that is you got a million dollars of income, multiply it times 85%, all your expenses should not be greater than $850,000. I'm talking about all the operation costs on a dairy, including the interest. Uh, this also should include depreciation and family living. And that should not exceed that because you got to have something left over uh, when all the bills are paid. So what I'm saying is we got 15% of that milk check left over to take and invest in other items or to pay additional principal down. Uh, this is certainly a key factor. Now, I do see expense rates, and this will vary in area to area, uh, farm to farm, and I have the privilege of traveling much in the U.S. particularly, but I will see some operations where they have a 65% expense rate, and others uh, 85, and, and some unfortunately exceed that. Uh, one item that is in the, the lower expense rates, obviously you've got your debt paid down, uh, you're not going to be spending as much on interest. The other thing is depreciation. I mentioned before needs to be part of this expense. And principal repayment. Now, generally, principal repayment and depreciation equate it out to about the same number. Uh, and if, uh, the, the items that, sh that a person buys, I know we've had some accelerated depreciation here in the fast in the last couple of years, but the, uh, that's an expense. And unfortunately, the IRS does not see depreciation. They see depreciation as expense, but they do not see principal as an expense. Principal is dollars that you're gonna pay taxes on it. But you should have the depreciation to offset that. So again, all expenses, including depreciation and family living, should not exceed 85%. All right, let's go to the next item, debt per cow. Boy, I tell you what, I also get an awful lot of uh, looks and discussions whenever we talk about this. $3,000 to $5,000 cow is a pretty comfortable level that lenders are comfortable with. In fact, as I travel uh, towards the East Coast, I find that a lot of lenders there in that $3,500 to $4,000 a cow that they're comfortable with when it comes to debt per cow. Uh, I can tell you I have seen uh, debts as high as uh, 7000 A lot has to do with terms. Obviously, if we take and have borrowed money, 
based on a five-year amortization or a 10-year amortization, that certainly helps because you don't have the amount of principal that's coming back and it lowers the amount of monthly payment. Uh, real estate generally is put on a 20-year amortization. Uh, sometimes dairy producers want to pay things off faster, but be careful for that. Make sure you're not making yourself cash poor because you are paying off principal too fast. Cattle and machinery generally run between a seven, three and a seven year amortization, again with real estate in the 20 year amortization. Uh, I don't know, good or bad, I've seen uh, dairy operations run as high as $10,000 debt per cow. Boy, I tell you what, that really makes tough. Uh, it makes it tough to make ends meet. Uh, even when we go to the seven-year amortization, uh, that makes it difficult at times. Uh, when you're working with a farm service agency, and I see a lot of young producers uh, work with those folks, a lot of times they can stretch the amortizations out as far as four years on real estate. I always look at these young folks and I say, you got any idea how old you're going to be in 40 years? But it certainly does help the cash flow uh, when you get the dairy up and going. Uh, the other thing lenders will do is they'll do FSA guarantees, and those are $1,355,000 right now that the lender can get a 90% guarantee on if the lender is working with the Farm Service Agency. That also can be stretched out on personal property to a 15-year amortization and on real estate as far as uh, a 40-year. Uh, generally, 20, 25 years uh, is usually in most of the case there. Now, the other way to look at this, I encourage you to uh, write this down and figure this out on your own. And this is looking at debt per 100 pounds of milk that's sold. Take the total debt divided by the 100 pounds of milk that you sell. You should not exceed $20 of debt per 100 pounds of milk. Now, where does this fit in? Well, if I've got a herd of cattle and I'm producing 20,000 pounds of milk or producing 28,000 pounds of milk, that additional pounds of milk, that's being produced, and yeah, I know there's some variable cost with it. Most of your fixed costs are there. You should be able to handle some additional debt. But again, the key benchmark is making sure you're not exceeding that $20 per 100 pounds of milk. So it's not just debt per cow. It can also be debt per 100 pounds of milk. And here again, less is better. And I, I need to make this comment because I know when I make uh, these these statements and we talk about debt per cow, I don't ever want to give people the idea that borrowing money is bad. And it's not bad. Uh, borrowing money is okay. As long as you borrow it and you make uh, sure that it's going to be producing income. In fact, just a good benchmark and think about this next time you're going to buy something. For every dollar you invest or purchase something, it should be that item that you purchase should be able to produce a dollar of gross income a year. Now let's take a simple example. Let's buy a cow. Let's pay two thousand dollars for a cow. That's a pretty decent cow. Uh, that cow should generate you about forty five hundred dollars of gross income per year. Pretty good payback, isn't it? All right. I know we need a roof over that cow, so you think about what you buy as far as facilities and what you have to spend there. Think about those tractors you sell, and not negative towards tractors, don't get me wrong, but you need to think about the kind of income that's being generated for that. And of course, uh, really the hot item in the last five years is how about land purchase? Uh, there's a real dandy right there, and think about the return that you're going to get on that. But before you make an emotional decision on buying something, think about that dollar investment and receiving a dollar of gross income every year from then on out for every dollar that you spend in buying that particular asset. All right, let's move on to the next item. Equity positions should be at least 30%. And that's simply the net worth of the dairy, what you own, divided by the total assets that you have in that dairy. Um, simple way of looking at, simple example, I have a $200,000 net worth and I've got $500,000 of assets out there, that means I've got a 40% equity position with that. And here again, more is better. I'll say this, and as I get a chance to work with a lot of different lenders across the country, boy, you need to be at that 30% equity position if you're really going to get any additional money from a lender 
And if you get below that 30%, a lender becomes quite uncomfortable. Uh, comfort level is 40, even 50% is a real decent comfort level for a lender. You get north of 50% uh, equity and they become extremely comfortable, providing there's a decent cash flow there. Uh, dairy producers that are going to expand. You may have to be at a 50 or 60% equity level to expand, and by the time the expansion is done, you know, because of the depreciation that takes place on new facilities, you may end up at a 40 or even 30% equity position. Uh, but that's extremely important to make, maintain that equity position. I know this is a struggle sometimes for young producers when they get started, but in general, you want to have a real comfort level with your lender. You need to have something north of 30%. And again, more is better when it comes to this particular category. Uh, next, let's talk about uh, turning the assets that you have. Do a class at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and talk to students about all the financials that deal with the dairy operation. I think one of the most... Uh, highest amount of feedback that I get from students when they come back is when I've gone through and done for personal balance sheets with them. We do the class in a computer lab and they all do their own and we do a mock-up in front. And I've had students come back a couple years later and said, you know, that's really one of the most important things that I've done is when we've done balance sheets. And Part of the balance sheet, of course, is the total assets that you have. In fact, I kid people, before you go out on New Year's Eve, make sure you do a balance sheet. But what I'm talking about turning the assets, look at the total assets you have on a dairy. Divide that by the total income. And let's just take a look at an example here, and this always helps. If I've got a million-dollar farm, total assets, cattle, machinery, real estate, and I generate $350,000 of income, that means I'm turning those assets in 2.8 years. What's the average for the U.S.? Most farms, it takes four years to turn those assets. Now, the key point here is, that do we have too many assets, too many dollars involved, or are we not generating, generating enough gross income? Um, every business out here, folks, uh, away from agriculture and ag agriculture needs to look at their productivity based on how quickly they can turn the assets. And obviously with some of these land values that we have out here today, it's a little tough to take and turn those assets very quickly because of the, the large amount of dollars that we have stuck in the land uh, at this point. In fact, I get questioned quite often, well, Gary, what should I put as a value of land? Uh, I bought my land 10 years ago, and now the neighbor's land is selling for $8,000 an acre. Should I put that on there? Well, obviously, if you boost the price of your land, that's going to make that turn on assets uh, a lot lower. It's going to take you more years to get that turn. So I would just do a very conservative, put a very conservative number on that asset side, of the balance sheet when it comes to land, uh, unless you're going to sell the place tomorrow. And I certainly don't recommend people having an appraiser come out and appraising the farm on a regular basis. That's a waste of money unless you're going to be doing some reborrowing. But take a look at the total assets you have out there divided by the gross income and just see how close you can get to that three-year number. Now, obviously, lower is better. Uh, I have had dairies that have been able to turn those assets in a year and a half, able ability to generate a great deal of gross income and hopefully that turns out to be net income as well. And again, think about those high price land values and uh, be careful not to inflate that. In fact, uh, that question again is always coming up is what value should I put on land? And what I just described, being very conservative and your lender is going to feel a lot better about that too. In fact, your lender is probably going to have a big part in putting a number on that. All right, return on those assets, ROE. Uh, this is some terminology I know that you don't deal with on a regular basis, but it's something really that you need to think about, and that is looking at the net income on a dairy and dividing that by the total assets on that dairy. I'll use a simple example again. If I have $80,000 of net income, 
Now, when I say net income, let's make sure we define that. That's after all of the expenses. That's after principal or depreciation. And again, those are generally pretty equal. And that's after you take a family living expense. A lot of times, the dairy producers don't take a, an expense charge. Uh, they basically take what's left over at the end of the year. And what I'm saying is put a number down there that, that you're taking out of that dairy. And I, I've seen that range all the way across the board. But if we have an example here of an $80,000 income, and I've got a million dollars of assets, that's 0 0.08, or that says I'm getting an 8% return on my assets. Uh, any number, of course, higher is better. And I've seen people get as much as a 15% return. Now, one way to take and uh, compare that, we're not maybe a good example today with bank CDs. Uh, some of you might be chuckling now because most bank CDs are paying, five-year bank CDs are paying about 1%. Uh, so you got to be able to beat the bank is what I always tell people. But you've got a huge investment out there, and you certainly need a reasonable return on the kind of assets that you have there. Uh, and, and, and here's a key point, and, and something that's good to discuss with your lender and make sure that your lender knows that you understand this. There's a difference between earned income and appreciated income. Earned income is dollars that are left over after all the expenses are paid. And that's like this $80,000 that I'm talking about here that theoretically should be left over in the checkbook at close of business on year end. And I know you've got prepaid expenses and cash moves on a daily basis a lot. But in essence, when you take that final snapshot of the P&L, profit and loss statement at the end of the year, you need to have some profit left over. But that's earned income. Appreciated income, if you simply take and say, well, I bought land for $3,000 10 years ago. That land now is selling for $8,000. So I'm going to bump my land value of my acres that I have up to $8,000 an acre. Boy, don't I feel good because look at how nice my balance sheet is. But a lender is going to somewhat frown on that because uh, that's not earned assets. That's simply taking and calling it an inflationary value uh, or appreciated, as we call it in the lending business, um, and looks nice on paper, but it, it really doesn't say that your dairy is profitable by simply adding. That says you're in the right place at the right time, and don't get me wrong. Uh, if there's anything you could invest in in the last five years, stock market, houses, you name it, um, land has been a very good return. And be, particularly because of what's going on with some of the grain prices and the fact that dairy producers needed more so for nutrient management than, than even forage, uh, that has kept skyrocketing and jacking up that price of land. But remember those two terms, and this is something that it's just good to keep in mind as you're talking to your lender about the fact that here I've got X number of dollars of earned income and I've left my asset values, my land values, real estate values, cattle values about the same. So therefore, I'm not talking about appreciated assets, and I think your lender will appreciate that. And again, this is income after family living, after taxes, and after the other expenses that occur on the dairy. All right, knowing the cost of production. This is really where we need to spend the balance of our time here now. Uh, absolutely key. Uh, sadly, I get uh, a lot of uh, blank looks sometimes when we talk about cost of production and producers say, hey, doing all I can. Well, it's important to at least know where that is. And here we take all of the expenses on that dairy and we divide it by the 100 pounds of milk that you're selling. Uh, year in, uh, pretty obvious and pretty easy to come up with that 100 pounds of milk and looking at the expenses. Sometimes there seems to be this mystique about keepers. How do I come up with this uh, cost of production? And it isn't really that tough, folks. But you take a look at that. Uh, take your Schedule F on your uh, taxes, if nothing else. Uh, you got to be careful, though, if you prepaid expenses. And I'll caution you on this when you 
uh, figure this cost of production. If you prepaid expenses at the end of the year, which agriculture is allowed to do because agriculture does cash, uh, prepares taxes on a cash basis. So if you pay extra uh, money for fee or other services that you know you're going to spend money on, such as uh, cropping expenses, you got to make sure that you back that out of there. Otherwise, you're, uh, you're loading up uh, too many expenses. And the same token, if you've got payables out there, if you have feed bills, for instance, or fertilizer chemical bills that you hadn't paid the previous year and you let them go to the next year, uh, that didn't show up on your expenses as a cash expense, did it? You need to take and add that in to a given year's expense to make sure that you get the proper expenses in the proper year. Uh, simple examples, if I've got a dairy that's uh, we got a cost of production of $400,000, and again, I'm using some pretty simple examples, but just to come up with, uh, with a way of making references, that's the best way to look at these numbers. And we've produced, uh, uh, take a 100 cow herd producing 20,000 pounds of milk, or in this case, 20,000 hundred weights, $17.39 a hundred. That's, that we have as far as the cost of production. Range-wise, I see that range, well, probably right now with the kind of expenses that we have out there on dairies, uh, probably the lowest people that are able to produce milk for is around that 1650 mark. Um, 1750 is is pretty normal. Uh, I do see all the way up to $21 and above that, and obviously, uh, we all know what's going on with the milk price and what has been in the last year. Uh, this doesn't make too much profitability when you're looking at some of these uh, uh, higher cost of producing milk. Um, things like uh, knowing the basis, in other words, what is the additional dollars that you're receiving for income over the class three price if that's how you're being paid. Uh, that certainly adds. Uh, to the milk check, but basically you got to look at that that total cost of production and compare it to the 100 pounds of milk. Remember on our dairies, pretty obvious, I'm stating the obvious here that 90% of the income comes from milk. I do see a number of dairies that have, uh, for instance, steers, or maybe they're doing some custom operating with their equipment, uh, are taking and now starting to enter price out. Uh, sometimes the heifer raising part of a dairy operation is also being enterprised out, where the dairy producer is uh, taking the specific expenses uh, from that uh, part of the dairy and separating it from the milk cows and just getting some key numbers on what does it cost to produce a heifer when she freshens at 24 months. Uh, what, is, what are we really making on this uh, custom work that we're doing in the extra equipment that we bought? Um, we're selling extra grain, and this is something that you have to be careful. Those of you that are raising uh, corn or soybeans and selling that as cash, uh, make sure that you're pulling that expense out of that cost so you're not charging those poor cows for the expenses of raising the crops. So that really needs to be separated uh, from that. And again, there's two ways of looking at this cost of production. And this is pretty important. We look at those expenses, and then we take principal, and I call this the cash cost of producing milk. We take the total expenses, which includes the interest, take the principal that you pay back, not the depreciation, pull depreciation out of the formula this time, then add the family living, in other words, the dollars that you're taking out of there. If you have hired employees on the farm, you certainly have a labor cost there. But take your family living out of there and take the, these three expenses or these categories and divide that by the 100 pounds of milk. That'll give you the cash cost of operating. Look at this as the checkbook. These are the expenses that come out of the checkbook on an annual basis, on a monthly basis, and compare that to the 100 pounds of milk that you're producing. Another way to look at that is what we call a cruel, and I'm not going to try to make accountants out of you today, but if we look at the accrual cost of production, this is where we need to make sure 
that we have the the proper expenses. And again, if we're doing some prepaids, even in, even up here where we talk cash expenses, make sure you pull those prepaids out of there. But look at the expenses for that year. And now let's just look at the depreciation, not the principal, but the depreciation and the family living and take these three categories. And that gives you an accrual cost of production. Uh, really a good way to look at it is from a cash cost of production because Again, that's what comes out of the checkbook. That's extremely important. That's what you got left over when all the bills are paid. And that's where you want to just see just how efficient you are. And you know, I tell producers, in fact, Danny Kleinfelter down in Texas A&M makes a great point about just being 5% better at what you do. And he says a lot of times that's the difference between an average dairy and one that does a good job or one that really struggles. And just 5% better, just think if you could lower that expense rate 5%. And I know it's so easy to say that, but think about the things you do on a daily basis. And that's why as I open with my opening statement, it's extremely important. Think about the decisions you make. 5% better, 5% more milk production. Uh, you know, being able to just get, how about, how about uh, saving a few more calves? You know what? It wasn't too many years ago that, oh my goodness, we had people losing 10% of their calves. Uh, today I get on a lot of dairies, I talk to a lot of producers only losing 1% of their calves. What if we had 5% less metabolic problems, plus or minus 30 days of calving? All of this certainly has a effect on the cost of production. All right, a lot of times when I put this presentation on or make these comments, I always have somebody in the audience say, well, Gary, you know, if I can't break any of these rules, can I bend a few of them? And that always uh, comes with uh, chuckles, particularly when we have an audience. So let me just go through these and, and let's talk about these. Uh, liquidity, all right? We talked about the liquidity. What if we had a dollar fifty cents for every dollar of current liability? Dollar fifty current assets to dollar to $1 of liability. If we get a one-to-one, -one, that really gets tight, and the lender is going to have a bit of a challenge with that. In fact, along with this, uh, make sure right now uh, you're really looking at the liquidity on your dairy operation, the ability to pay your bills. Uh, talking to some of the uh, different lenders around, you really want to make sure producers have enough cash on hand or the ability to get that cash through lines of credit. Now remember, a line of credit is going to turn out to be a liability, but at least if you need those dollars that you're able to get them. Uh, how about that 20% of that milk check to pay principal and interest? Well, bending the rules, you know, can you get 25%? Could be, but boy, it's going to make it tough operating. That's why I like to see that 15% and just saving that 20% for times when, when they get a little difficult. Expense rate. 85% uh, um, pretty good target. I wish it could be less. I mean, if, you can, if you're running 90%, that's really going to make it struggle. And the other thing you need to think about, I guess no matter what age you are when you're milking cows, uh, particularly those people that start to think about retirement, and I know when people are younger folks don't think about that, but if you're not building the equity in that balance sheet, uh, what are you saving up for retirement? You know, what's that dairy going to be worth? I, I have the real privilege of working with a number of dairies that are transferring the farm from one generation to the next. And it just really pleases me when I see the uh, couple that are in their middle 50s that have the ability of not only farm assets, but maybe off-farm assets. And then maybe they put some money in mutual funds and other types of investment, off-farms investments. And now for that next generation coming on, uh, that first generation can be the banker or they can use the collateral that they have in their real estate in order to help the next generation uh, start dairying. If you haven't checked lately, there's a whole lot of zeros behind the numbers in those balance sheets. So uh, it's real important to make sure that, that you are putting that cash away on a regular basis. So uh, expense rate, I don't want to bend that one too much. Debt per cow. And I talked that we could even see $7,000 a cow. So you could bend that rule by a bit. But you just got to make sure that you've got enough money left over 
take care of the rest of the bills. I always tell young people, particularly when we get them going, is uh, remember you've got to take the wife out for fish on a Friday night every now and then, so don't get yourself so strapped that you can't do anything. Um, and be careful on that debt. Again, that's not bad, but make sure it's manageable and make sure you're getting a good return for every dollar you're investing. Equity position. Oh, I'm going to say that at 30% now is getting to be pretty much bottom line. In fact, there are some lenders out there that unless you're uh, 40 or 50%, uh, they won't even take a look at uh, doing business with you. And uh, that's, that's really tough uh, when you don't have those kind of equity positions. But uh, pretty hard to do much with that. Uh, turning your assets in three years, all right, maybe you're going to be turning them in four years. Okay, that's acceptable. But I'd really like to see people hit these targets rather than trying to stretch them and go under them. A return on assets and profitability. It's really a pleasure to sit down with producers when we're looking at 15% return on assets that are generating uh, a great return on the dollars that they've got invested out there. Now, there's certainly another number here, and that's the return on equity. Uh, but if we we look at the return on assets, uh, that's still going to show some good profitability. And then the cost of producing 100 pounds of milk, that's extremely important. Um, look at these, these eight items. Again, a lender is going to be able to and has to look at many more ratios. Since 2008, there's just so many additional rules and regulations that the lenders have to deal with. Now, whether it be the FDIC, our banks, or the Farm Credit Administration in Washington, D.C., uh, dealing with the farm credit uh, people. Uh, all of these people are under uh, more scrutiny than they ever have. So a lot of times when a lender says no, maybe at times, it's uh, maybe because it's the regulator that's breathing down their neck that isn't necessarily giving them all the latitude that they once had. So with that, uh, we now have uh, 15 minutes for questions, and that tries to simplify things for you. But I really would like to see each and every one of you write these items down, figure them on your own dairy operation. The next time you see your lender, go in and talk to them about it and say, well, I, I, I put some numbers to this uh, particular session that I was in, and, and let, me, let me share these with you. Uh, it also tells the lender that you know a lot about your dairy operation. If you've got a handle on these items, the lender's going to feel pretty comfortable with you. So with that, uh, Kathy Lee, do we have some questions that have popped in there that we can have for discussion? Yeah, we have one to start with, and I just remind everybody that we have the chat box there, and if you have questions, go ahead and type them in, and we'll get to them. Um, the first question that um, we have is, what should the turnover rate be for a situation or farm where there's rented facilities and rented land? Well, that's a, that's a great question when, because if you're renting the land and facilities, uh, those are assets that you don't earn. And in that particular case, uh, you should be able to turn those assets a lot less than three years. Uh, probably that's where you're getting into, I would say, about a year and a half. Uh, it sounds like mostly the investment is going to be, first of all, in cattle. Uh, going to have some feed assets out there, probably some equipment that you're going to need to take care of the cattle. But And that could be as low as one year. But if you're renting all the facilities, I would say one to uh, one and a half years is when those assets need to be turned over. So it, must, it should be uh, lower than the three-year turnover. Okay, thanks. I think some other questions are being typed in, but I have a question. Um, obviously, to be able to get to these numbers, you have to have a pretty good farm accounting system. I wondered if you could maybe touch upon just some key features that people should be looking for when they're um, putting together a farm financial system or looking at software as such. Well, accuracy certainly is very important. And I think one of the uh, more common ones out there is QuickBooks. Uh, if a person uh, does to brings QuickBooks on in their dairy, they need to make sure that uh, they understand it thoroughly. Because once you start punching in some of the categories and numbers, um, some of those are not reversible. 
So you need to make sure that they're meaningful. Uh, it would be a ver very good idea to sit down with your accountant and discuss just uh, how those categories should be um, listed in there and that, that they are done correctly. I, I tell you what, over the years and, and with the age of computers now and softwares that we, systems that we have, um, I've seen some really good hand-kept bookkeeping systems. I know some of the uh, farm management systems out here uh, have had books that they've passed out in years that people can keep track of monthly and annual expenses. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing magic with the computer. Now, obviously, the larger the operation, uh, that's going to be part of it. But the important thing is to understand it. So QuickBooks, uh, Red Wing um, also has a pretty good program. There's some other nice Excel programs out there. I would suggest talking to the accountant that you're working with and finding out what they would suggest because those are the kind of numbers that they're going to be looking at uh, when it comes to the ledger and the categories. And the balance sheet is pretty straightforward. Uh, sometimes I see lenders that just send worksheets out to producers and uh, just get the basic cow numbers and some of the inventories. I hope everybody out there is getting a current balance sheet. I know there's some producers out there that do quarterly balance sheets, but if you're going to do a good one, you need to make sure you've got good inventories on there. So that's where I would start making sure I've got, understand the system that I'm going to put in. And if you're going to do a QuickBooks, uh, don't think you're going to sit down at 1030 at night after you put a long day in and start punching numbers. Uh, I'll tell you what, there will be more mistakes there than what it's worth, and it's the old garbage in, garbage out thing. So make sure you've got a good system, talk to your accountant, and if you're not going to put the numbers in, have somebody reliable putting those numbers in. Okay. Um, and we've got a comment from one of the listeners who said they're involved with the farm business management program through their local college, and they've had good, uh, been able to work well with them. Oh, there's some extremely good programs there with the tech, technical colleges and universities. So the resources are out there. There's no question about that. Okay. You made a kind of a comment along along this line, but these eight um, items here, you were talking about looking at them once, you know, once a year annually. Are, is there any any of those that where it might be beneficial to look at them more often? Well, yeah, that's that's a great point. You know, there's so many things to talk about here. Uh, these things really, sh a lot of them should be looked at monthly. I mean, when we look at and all, uh, let's talk about the uh, the amount of the milk check that's going out as far as principal and interest. Take a look at it. Generally, dairies uh, will do monthly milk assignments with their lenders, so that's going to be pretty, pretty standard. Um, if I just walk through these, uh, liquidity, well, that's pretty much uh, once a year that you're going to look at that, but you also may want to look at what's uh, going on as far as uh, what's in the checkbook and what money is available, what lines of credit are available, where the payables are, making sure that those are being uh, stayed on top of. An expense rate, um, particularly if a dairy is doing a lot of planting in the spring, that can be somewhat skewed. I know uh, the consulting consultants that I work with will uh, stretch that over a 12-month period of time because, yes, it's spent in one month, but from an accrual standpoint, it's, it's really spread over a 12-month period of time. Uh, equity position is pretty much going to be on an annual basis. Um, asset turnover, the same with that. Uh, operation profitability, you may want to look at that on a monthly basis, but it, again, depending on uh, just when a lot of those expenses uh, roll in there. Uh, cost of production, you, you have, have a system to take and look at just what the monthly expenses are running and dividing it by the cost and the 100 pounds of milk that are coming onto that farm on a monthly basis. It may give you a little heads up of what's going on with expenses. So yes, a lot of these can be evaluated on an annual basis, but particularly the cost of production and watching liquidity is something you need to watch on a pretty regular basis, probably monthly. Quarterly uh, would be excellent. Uh, that probably gives you a much better look at things. Okay. Uh, there's another question. It says, in order to have an 8% return on assets in a three-year turnover rate, um, would it, shouldn't you really have a 75% expense rate? So I guess oh, question. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Um, and that's exactly right. I mean, obviously, the, the lower that expense rate is, the better the, uh, the return on assets and profitability uh, is going to be. So no question about that. Uh, anytime you can lower that expense rate, uh, that's going to help in all those categories. So I, I totally agree with that. But you know, the important thing is, is, is where are you today? Where were you at the end of last year when you look at these eight items? And then compare them to where you're going to be at the end of this year. Uh, you may not hit all of these 100%, but at least if you, you know where you are, it's just like taking a trip. You know, the old analogy, if you don't have a road map and you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get someplace? So uh, that, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, if you're going to achieve some of these, you're going to have to lower. That's why I use less than or greater than some of these categories. Uh, you know, you can, you can exceed some of these as well, uh, particularly profitability, and that's okay. But, yeah, that's a great point, and recognizing the fact that uh, you're going to need to move some of these in a few different directions to achieve those levels of returns. Okay. And we have someone that has asked if you could re-explain briefly what the asset turnover rate is. All right. Let's, uh, let's do that. You know, we've got a little time here, so let's just back through that asset turnover. Right here. All right. Let's, let's just start here. Look at that. And, 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 again, I understand people aren't accountants, but look at the total assets. And, and I'll go to this second bullet point here. You've got a million dollar dairy, and you look at the total income, total gross income that's being generated on that dairy, and you just divide, divide that out, and that says in two and a half years, we're turning those assets. If it's taking us more that that four year, that's going to be a problem. You know, some get five and six, and that's way too much. But just simply taking that million bucks, Divide it by 350000 in this case, and it tells you just how many years it takes you to turn those assets. Okay. I think you got the question answered for the person. Uh, it looks like somebody else is typing in. Um, I know I've... Uh, I've thrown a number of items in a way to calculate these things out, but uh, a lot of it is just uh, division and multiplication in most cases. But again, once you have some references, and that's why I wanted to put some example references in here for the audience to uh, just get an idea of just where this is. And you'll make this, uh, this information available, Kathy, to producers? Yes, it'll be um, posted on, yeah, the, the whole presentation will be archived, posted online, yep. Okay, and, of course, this is being recorded as we speak as well. So right, yep. People can go back and listen to it again if you didn't particularly catch uh, one of the key points. So another uh, question, any comment on asset turnover rate with the current grain farmers and replacing lots of new equipment last year and this year with high corn? high price corn. Yeah, yeah that's uh, probably a grain producer's uh, question there. Uh, there's a uh, kind of a, I guess, kind of an interesting comment going around that those grain producers that can't afford to buy any more equipment because everything in the shed is new. Uh, I know the last few years have been very profitable to grain producers, particularly last year. And, well, even if we didn't get a crop, and I'm, I'm fully recognized it was a drought, uh, there was some pretty good crop insurance checks that were uh, handed out as well. But in general, grain producers have been making some pretty good income. With a machine shed full of machinery and a high in price of land out there, and when we look at the, I don't know, we're looking at forage corn right now, if I may use that terminology, uh, it may be harder to get that, that turn in assets. And maybe that's where we're going to see some of that four-year turn uh, maybe extended from there if you look at the value of that machinery. So uh, maybe difficult to do, and I know you got to have a good equipment because when it's time to put the crop in and take it off, uh, you need to have good equipment to get the job done. 
but you may have to just recognize that you're not going to get the kind of return that you should. You know, one way of look at that facetiously is let's cash everything in, take it in the bank, and uh, put it in CDs. Now, I realize we've got a Uncle Sam uh, going to be out there with his hand when it comes to taxes and a comment like that. And if the best you can get is 1% of the bank um, and a pretty low turnover there, uh, Army is a long-term commitment. Uh, you don't just make your decisions on one year. You look at long-term, and you want to make sure the dollars that you invest long-term, you're going to get a good A return on that. But the uh, point is well taken with uh, expensive machinery, and you're going to take some depreciation on that machinery, uh, at least 10%, I would think, that you'd want to take uh, over a period of time. And then uh, looking at the uh, the value of land, so it's it's going to take uh, it's going to lower or increase those uh, that turnover rate because of that value of, of the assets you have in those grain farm. Um, I've got I've got another question, but I'll, as I before I ask it, I'll just remind everybody that we would like your feedback. And this uh, slide that's on the screen now, there's a link that you can uh, go into and and provide feedback. So the last question that we have is, in factoring an asset turnover, is it acceptable for a new farm to do a breakdown for each year over several years? Uh, and, and if I understand the question, it's should we break it down on an annual basis? I mean, maybe I'm not That's my interpretation. That. Oh, it looks like Doreen's. And you want to do that on an annual basis. That's correct. And you want to compare it year after year after year. And again, it's nice to write these items down and just call this a report card if you want to. How are you doing compared to last year? Did, did you improve in these different areas? Gary, I'd like to thank you um for all the information that you've shared with us today. And I'd like to thank our audience, too, for participating in today's discussion. So goodbye to everybody.